Hello everyone and welcome to the video for the new CAM module for Garotic 2. Uh, there's a lot of changes in this version so this video may be quite long and it could even be broken up into uh, two or three videos in the end. So let's take a look at what we need to do. Um, first of all, most of you will have noticed on the tool screen lately that there have been three buttons that have appeared. Uh, three axis, fourth axis, and CAD. The fourth axis and CAD button still will tell you that you cannot go to them, but if you press the three axis button, you'll be taken to uh, the new three axis CAM module, which is called Workbench. Um, let's quickly go over what's on the workbench just as a general overview before I show you how to use it in several ways. It's quite powerful and it has quite a bit in it and it's a huge change so like I said it may take a bit of explaining. Okay when you're on the screen um, first of all you'll see that we have a grid on the screen. Now the size of this grid is equal to your CNC system. Uh, this is modeled to be a place where you can throw stuff on a workbench and machine it if you like and the grid is to tell you uh, what the boundaries of your particular CNC table are. If I go back into our uh, settings our global options uh, for Garotic, you can see now that we have a box at CNC 2.5D work envelope. Um, so you're telling it the X and Y size. Mine is 400 millimeters by 400 millimeters. And this will automatically convert when you go between metric and English, which is why it'll tend to uh, get a few floating decimal points afterwards. Clamp distance is the distance around the sides of the work envelope um, that it will leave around a gear for uh, clamping purposes should you need it. Basically it's a way of saying keep my objects separated by this distance. Mine is set to 5 for 5 millimeters at the moment. You can also set an origin uh, anywhere from the center to any one of the corners. I leave mine bottom left uh, which is pretty much where most of us would be I think. So that when we look at our grid what we see is we have the head on the screen which tells you that you are allowed to rotate. This is so you can better visualize um, tool paths that you create. You can also see we have an origin sign down at the bottom left that tells you where zero zero is so that if we put something on the uh, table you'll know where it is. Um, on the right hand side of the screen you can see we have a current zoom mode as well as a current tool table info telling me that uh, currently I have a two millimeter diameter uh, bit selected with a 12 degree taper and no radius and it's a metric tool. Uh, first thing that we should probably look at is the first button over here on the side which is return. The return button simply takes us back to Gerotic where you can have your project tree and your tools and everything is as before. The second button on the um, workbench is toolbox and it's something that we should probably take a look at because it's one of the first things you'll have to understand. Here I brought up um, the toolbox dialog and as you can see I have metric and standard tools and they're given a name and after the name is a bunch of letters telling us basically what type of tool it is, uh, what the radius, the taper and, and so on. Um, is for the tool. You can design your tools here on this screen. You'll see there are a great many settings. I won't go through all of them because uh, most of them are self-explanatory anyways. But there's a couple of important things. First of all, there's a checkbox for metric um, which tells, it, tells you whether or not a tool is metric or standard. Um, both are used in any mode. In other words, if I'm a metric user, I can still enter uh, inch based tools as long as I uncheck metric. And when I go to use them, the system will automatically convert them to millimeters for me so that I can use them. The same thing is inversely true. If you're a person that uses imperial measurement systems and you pull up a 10 millimeter metric, that 10 millimeter metric will change automatically to 0.42 inches or whatever it is. Um, just take care of your feed rates and everything that they're set properly because they, they, the, there are post processors involved here and uh, a lot of the behavior of what happens in the G code in the end will come from uh, what you've done, done to design your tools. Um, the type of tool in terms you're left with three options at the moment that will probably be expanded but at the moment you can select N mil, ball mil and V bit. Uh, these are really just in order to categorize them on the screen to separate them for you but there is one other usage of it and that is if you select a v-bit uh, as a tool then the diameter becomes the uh, end diameter of a v-bit. In other words 
look at this V-bit that I have on the screen. You can see that it is a 14 millimeter V-bit with a two millimeter bottom flat. Well, you can see the two millimeter bottom flat on it and the top is 14 millimeters wide. This is not normally the way that you would specify a tapered bit, however. So if we go to an end mill, you can see this is a tapered end mill with a two millimeter diameter. The diameter of a taper is usually specified at the bottom of the taper. So this is starting with a two millimeter bottom flat and the diameter is a two millimeter taper with a uh, 12 millimeter or a 12 degree taper on it and this is what you end up with with a 25 millimeter long flute. The tool that you see on the screen should remotely resemble the tool that you have and is really a guide to help you as you're adjusting for the tools. If I set this to a 5 millimeter, for example and then hit apply you can see that we just got a lot wider because the bottom is now five millimeters which on a 12 millimeter taper is going to give quite a large uh, top section to it so if you play with this screen, I think that you'll find that it becomes obvious how it works. Uh, the only thing that you need to worry about is that if it's a V-bit, you're specifying diameter as the top, and if it's an end mill, you're specifying diameter as the bottom. Uh, ball mills fall in that same category uh, as an end mill. Uh, they're really both uh, the same object. In addition to specifying a bottom flat, which some people do for engraving bits, you can also specify a radius. If the radius is one half of the diameter, then you have a standard ball mill, which is on the screen now. But it is possible to give a radius which is much smaller, say a three millimeter, and what you can see now is we have a radius bottom of this end of this ball mill uh, with a flat section on the bottom as well and this would be an end mill with a radius edge so you can select the amount of radius that you want it automatically filled in how much of the bottom would be flat if I'm using that size of a radius so uh, just take care when you're designing your tools that they look similar to what you want and you'll be fine. You can enter any name for a tool and if you hit apply and that name is not currently in the list it will ask you if you want to add it to the list and you can do so. Also at the bottom here is a g-code tool number. This is the number that the system will put out for the for that tool in the g-code. You can also set the feed rate and plunge rate in addition to the spindle speed. Again the post processor is going to put out tool changes and spindles and everything else so uh, you need to worry about your spindle speeds etc if you're going to use them. You'll see a units here for the um, feed rate under millimeters per second, uh, millimeters per minute or inches per minute. Uh, these are currently unused and uh, are not um, real important. There's just a tag, but they probably will be used in the conversion process to put out the proper amount of feed rate for uh, the system in the end. Uh, we'll discuss that as time goes by. So that's our tool ta table. But there's one other thing here is a button that says favorites list included, and you can check that or uncheck it for any tool. Um, it basically creates a list of tools that you consider to be your favorite tools and for most of us we'd have two or three tools that we would use commonly uh, so rather than having to go into the tool crib each time and select a tool and hit OK in order to uh, select it we have a previous and a next button up here and what they do is they simply toggle through our favorite tools list so it's important which tools that you put into your list um, so that you can cycle through them and on the side of the screen uh, whenever you change a tool it will tell you what the new tool diameter is and so on now in addition to that uh, we have what are called hot settings the fact that you've selected a tool and normally you would want 600 feed rate for example doesn't mean that you're locked to that or would have to go back and change the table you can actually just type in a new feed rate plunge or spindle rpm uh, from uh, on the screen at the time that you're doing something if you want to quickly change it to something else. In other words, I may have selected by pushing plus and next, and you can see I've got the end mill inch up at the moment, and it's telling me my step over is 0.25. I may say, well, that's not an appropriate step over for what I'm doing. I want it to step over five millimeters because I'm in metric mode, so I can enter a five and hit enter, and now I've got a step over of five millimeters if I'm doing a pocket. Uh, so these are hot changes that allow you to quickly modify what's going on in a tool uh, as you wish. Next to that is job settings where we can set our 
depth uh, that we're going to do a particular operation, a final pass height, uh, safe Z, uh, tab width, number of tabs, and we can specify whether or not we want climb mill. Uh, we'll go over that in a minute when we actually do a gear. Next to that we have output options and they're all gray at the moment because none of them are, uh, there's nothing on the screen that we can do, but if we float our mouse over it, um, you'll see that you'll get an explanation on the screen. The first button will come up and say profile outside. Uh, the next one will see profile inside, profile center line. Uh, then we go to pocketing, engraving, and auto cut. Auto cut is used quite a bit in Garotic because of course Garotic already knows the order to cut a uh, gear in. The rest of the operations are there to allow us in future to do everything from engraved photographs to pocket things that you've drawn in the new CAD module. Uh, next to that we have a post module uh, where we can hit post and as you can see I get a message on the screen saying no objects have tool pass so it won't open up the post yet. We'll go into that shortly. Uh, next to that we have some controls for zoom mode, zoom to selection, zoom to all objects, zoom to work envelope, and then an undo and redo button uh, in case you've made a mistake, and then a coordinates uh, table. So that's basically everything that we have on the screen, so maybe we should take one gear and very quickly look at what it would take to uh, post one gear um, just for speed wise and uh, comfort. Okay, so we're going to go back to the screen and let's uh, take a circular and add a circular gear to the screen. Okay, like, like many things in Garotic, there's more than one way to do uh, most operations. And in this case, I can click on the gear on the screen so that it's selected and turns blue. And then I can hit a button on the selected properties page called send to workbench. If I do, we'll go to the workbench. Or I could click on the gear in the uh, project tree right click and on the menu you'll see that there is send selected to three axis workbench. Either way will work and you can send multiple items at a time as well. But for this first example let's just send one gear and see what happens. We'll hit send to workbench and as you can see we're now shown a um, visual of the workbench and our gear is on it. Uh, if we select the gear by clicking on it on the right hand side of the page We'll get a listing telling us the name of the gear, the number tool pass at this point zero, and where the center of that gear is on our CNC table at this point, the center of the gear is at 36 and a half approximately for that gear. Just by clicking the gear, however, we can drag it anywhere on our CNC table that we wish. When you select a gear, it should turn all greenish, uh, greenish yellow. Um, if it doesn't select closer to the outside of it, uh, we'll go. I'll explain that in a second. When I click on the gear a second time, you can see I get handle boxes, and these are used for rotating the gear. And in a round gear, it's probably not that important, uh, but if your gear wasn't round, uh, it could be important. Anyway, let's take a look at what it what it takes to uh, do a gear up. I'm going to click on the gear so it's completely yellow. And when I do, that means it is selected. And up here on the um, machining screen, you can see the letter A is the only one lit up, and that's auto cut. Because I've got the entire gear selected, uh, the only capability is to do an auto cut, because if we were to say do inside or outside profiles, it wouldn't know exactly where to do the profile. If I take the gear and zoom in on it, and I suppose that's the best way, actually. If you click a gear and move it, and let's say we click it and put it into a position, um, I can hit this button uh, on the zoom controls. You can see the first one is zoom to selection, the second one is zoom to all objects, and the third one is zoom to work envelope. The third one, zoom to work envelope, simply brings us in and shows us our grid. That's our work CNC table, so we zoom to it. The second button is zoom to all objects, which because we only have one object in the screen, takes us to that object. And the first button will take us to a selected object or selected object zoom, so that you can get a better look. So hitting the first button, zoom to selections, takes us to uh, this gear that we put on the screen. Now again, you can see that the gear is all yellow, and it gets that way if I select just outside of one of its profiles. And you can see our handle box here as well, where I can rotate the gear to make it fit. Not real important with a round gear, but as you'll see later with indicators and so on, it can be important to you. Uh, if I click on the inside of a profile, once a gear is selected, you can see it turns red. And when the profile turns red, you'll see up on the operations menu, three more buttons have lit up. Uh, profile outside, profile inside, and profile centerline. 
Um, it's up to you which ones you do. Obviously, when I hit the uh, auto button, and I'll hit it now, you can see the entire gear uh, gets machined where it can fit. Uh, we can see a red tool path coming from our origin and doing first the three spokes and then the outside of the gear. You'll notice that the shaft is not done. And the reason it's not done is our particular tool that we have selected at this point is too large. And you can see that by the fact that our tool path is going around the outside of the gear quite a distance from it. And there's no way that a six millimeter diameter tool is going to fit into this little tiny uh, shaft hole on this particular gear. So that would be a clue to you that your tool is too large. If we hit the delete button up here on the screen, because we have the entire object selected, it will ask us delete all paths on this object and we can say yes and it goes away. Uh, let's go for a smaller gear, so I'm just going to hit minus until we get down to a two millimeter gear. Uh, that's one of my favorites is the two millimeter, so I've selected it. And now if I hit auto, you can see that the shaft is done and it is done first. After the shaft is cut, we will go to the spokes and do those. And then finally, it will go to the outside and do the outside gear. So the orders are all taken care of with a single press of auto. If I rotate this so that we can see the bottom, so that we can see the tool path itself. You'll notice in some areas on the bottom there's a missing area. These are the tabs. I've told my system to give me two tabs with a tab width of two millimeters. Now these slots look longer than two millimeters but you have to remember that the tool itself is two millimeters wide so it's one millimeter on either side of these rise and lower points. Uh, you can tell which direction the tool is going because it lifts up with a red, a rapid, and then sinks back down with a plunge uh, when it goes to do those tabs and actually cut them out of the material. Uh, so that's all it takes is to highlight a gear and hit auto in order to do a typical gear in uh, Gearotic. But let's erase that tool path uh, just for the heck of it so we can also take a look at the other methods. Let's click on the shaft. You can see the shaft hole just turned red. And I can go up here on the screen and say profile inside. And we get an inside profile. Uh, tabs, by the way, only happen if there's room for them. As you can see on this particular shaft inside, there is no tab because, of course, there'd be no material left to tab anyway. The system knows that. Um, also, if we click on uh, uh, any other profile, let's click on one of the spokes and say um, profile outside. As you can see, we now have a profile on the outside. Double clicking, by the way, will take you back to a flat screen. And you can see that the order of the paths is from shaft to spoke now. Um, the order when you do an automatic is automatically selected to be the appropriate logical order to cut it so that things would uh, come out of your board properly. With tabs, that's not as important as your parts should be locked into the board uh, if you've done them. What's important here for the tabs is to recognize that the tabs only go up to the finish pass. So in the example of this spoke that we just did, you can see I told it to do a, uh, a depth of five millimeters. Um, but we're doing three millimeters at a time down. So the first pass will be three millimeters deep. And we'll try to go another three and see that that would make it past the bottom. So it will go up to one millimeter away from the final depth because we've asked for a final pass of one millimeter and it will cut that millimeter. Then it will do the final pass at five millimeters deep. And that's at the point at which it will do the slots. So these slots will only be as wide and as thin as your um, final pass and as wide as what you've said for tab width. So in this case, I'm going to end up with a two millimeter wide tab, uh, which is only one millimeter thick, which means it should saw off or snap off quite easily just by pushing on it. Um, be careful about hitting auto after you've already got uh, a tool done because it will redo paths and it can be hard to tell sometimes if you've got more than one of the same paths until you go to the post stage and we'll go over that in a second and actually do a post. So let's delete all the paths on this particular uh, object. Select the object itself, hit delete and they'll all delete. If you want to delete the paths in just a particular section, I could, for example, click on this spoke so it's red, hit delete, and it will say delete all paths assigned to the selected profile. It knows that we have a profile selected, so it will only delete the paths that are associated with that profile. So 
that's generally a quickie on how to get past on on a, a particular object make sure that your tool is selected properly that you've put in the defaults that you want and um, then generate your pass now I just regenerated all these paths with auto because that way we'll know that they're good um, let's take a look at post and post process this uh, this gear all right, so let's take a look at post processing. We've got uh, this gear on the screen, and I'm just going to select post to post process it. And you can see that we end up with a number of objects on this side. We only have one object at this point because we only have one on the screen. Uh, but it tells us it's Spur 5 is its name. Or, sorry, its name is Spur, and it has five tool paths. Over here on the right side are the five tool paths in order of the way that they're going to be cut. Uh, they're named as well. Uh, center poly is usually your shaft. It's the innermost hole. Uh, and then inner polys are your spokes. And then we have the odor profile. And those are the orders that it's going to cut. If you want to change an order, like for example, I have odor profile highlighted, I can push up and move the odor profile up or down the list uh, until I'm happy with the order that these things are going to be cut in. You have an up or down as well on the multiple uh, list of objects. And if you have more than one object, you can select which object you want to get done first. Uh, over here on the side, we have a post processor that you can select, and there are only two at the moment, default, mill, and laser, uh, but they're editable and creatable by you, and uh, they're in the folder, and we'll discuss that later on. You can define your own post processor for uh, the precision of the numbers that are going to come out, the way the axes are labeled, etc., etc. Uh, you can edit your prologue and epilogue here and put in whatever you want to come out uh, at the beginning and end of your G-code files. Um, when you're happy with everything, you just hit the post button. Uh, I haven't given this thing a project name yet, so I would have to uh, simply enter a project name first. And when I do that, it's going to create and open up the test project folder in your gear data folder where you can enter the name of the file. I'll enter test, and our file has been put out. So if we now take a look at that test file, here is the test file that we just created. As you can see, we get some comments telling us uh, what object that we're currently cutting. We get a rapid to position. We get uh, comments telling us uh, what profile that we're cutting within the object. We get a spindle off, an M6T0 message because I did go to with tool zero. We get a spindle control command, a plunge down to depth, and then a feed rate, and we start cutting. And uh, this continues all the way through until we get to the end. Object spur ends, end of 2D program. Your epilogue would be put out down here, and your prologue would be put out at the beginning had you specified one. And that's all it takes to get uh, G code in general. The post file ends in PST in your folder. You'll find a uh, default mill and a laser.pst, and there are instructions in the file as to how to change it. So let's take a look at a more complex example. I'm going to hit new and uh, start a new project so that everything's back. And I'm going to open up a, uh, uh, a file. Let's open up uh, clock one. So this is a clock that I just happen to have on my system. Uh, you can see there's a lot of gears to it. Let's talk about what we would do if we want to machine this project. I'm going to click on the first gear. Uh, hit my shift key and click on the spur 11 and as you can see they all select on my project tree. If I now hit the send a workbench button or right click and say send a three axis workbench you can see all the objects now automatically get shunted to my page and here's where your zoom buttons can come in handy. Uh, if we say zoom to all objects you can see that we move out quite a ways. Now I should mention that this is a workbench. You don't have to cut everything on it. These gears for example are too big to deal with at the moment so I can just shunt them over to the side. Um, if we say uh, the center button which is or the final button which is zoom to work envelope it will zoom in on our grid and we can deal more effectively with our grid for example these indicators uh, I may not be happy with where they are let's drag a box and as you can see I can just drag one box and I'll select everything within the box the auto button is lit up because it knows about uh, all these objects so I'm gonna hit auto and as you can see what happens is they all get a tool path all done with the same tool which is typically how I work anyways but uh, many of you won't you may want to auto these one at a time with a different tool in operation so 
my indicator here is off screen so I, I'm going to want to move that and if I click it so that I get my handle boxes I can rotate the object I can grab it and move it to wherever I want and uh, rotate it in so that it fits onto my CNC table into a good location where I know that it could be cut. Uh, this gear over here I may want to just move out of the way. You don't have to machine all the gears. You can click on any gear and remove it from the list if you wish. Uh, if you have your handles you can uh, rotate stuff around. You'll see that the toolpath rotates with the object. You can uh, rotate it and move it wherever you want. Toolpath moves with it. And when you're happy with the way everything is we can post it. Uh, you can also by clicking on one to get add additional tool pass if you like so you could say profile the outside of that one as well if for some reason you would want to do that uh, the profiling is quite smart if we're profiling the inside of thin areas they'll go as if it's a pocket it'll create multiple tool pass uh, just for a profile even so uh, we have all these gears selected we know they're going to fit on our CNC table because the grid is our CNC table so let's hit the post button and when I do now you can see that we have many objects and it tells us how many tool paths are on each object and when we click on the object it tells us the tool paths that are within that object um, as you can see for this one I have two odor profiles uh, for some reason I probably just did that on spur 9 uh, so I could delete one of them if I wished by hitting the delete button or I can uh, shift things around by moving up and down uh, you can remove an object entirely by hitting the remove and it'll remove that object's paths and if we hit OK you can see that uh, this object has been removed from the toolpath list. It won't cut. You can leave it on the table. It won't have any effect. Uh, another thing is as you move things around uh, you may find that it's no longer uh, an effective cutting order for the various things that you're going to cut and in the post dialog there is a button for auto order and if we hit it it'll automatically put those into what it thinks is an appropriate order for a fast uh, cut of all those objects one after the other okay that's it for an introduction um, to the machine module we'll probably have another part as things progress this is brand new code so I'm sure that things will change somewhat over the next little while but this is much more powerful than uh, than our previous cam module and I think that in the end you'll like it. Uh, I should notice or I should note that all these things are permanent um, and save with your project. If we were to uh, go back home and save our project now as clock one uh, start a new project when I load clock one as my project again we'll just let that load in. Uh, when I go to my three axis workbench you can see that we're back to where we were. All our tool paths are still there uh, and we're free to move stuff around uh, and recut them or redo them. Um, I'm sure that there's more work that needs to be done and hopefully your usage of it will tell me exactly what we need to do. One other thing I should point out guys before I go is way over here on the far right of your screen is your help a boat box. This is where you get to see your license information. You'll notice it had now changed. Um, I've stolen my old Mach 3 uh, credits list and I've put many of you in the credits. Those of you who have been most supportive on the forum and who have answered other people's questions and in, even those who have just simply posted to show us what you've done, we've added you into the list. Uh, some of you by name, some of you by alias from the group. Um, if you have an alias on here and you'd like it changed to your name, to your real name, just let me know. Or conversely, if your name is in there and you'd like it removed, <laughs> let me know that as well. Also on this list though, and the reason I mention it, is a help button underneath which when pushed will take you to a new edition of the manual uh, which although not finished yet has a good many things in it which may help you out. Uh, so use the help a boat box if you want to uh, look at your manual or to see your name in lights. Um, also on the main screen uh, there is a question mark after the uh, output options and if you hit the question mark you'll get a list of uh, videos that uh, you can go to for various sections of the program. Uh, one last note about the output options. I will leave them all alone for now, but the CNC option will eventually disappear once the new fourth axis is done. Uh, the way the system will work is you can put out 
printed files or STLs or DXFs from up in that output section, uh, but all CNC work will be done with the three axis, fourth axis, and CAD module buttons uh, for when we're drawing things like uh, creating your own imaginary gears and so on. Uh, that's it. Thanks.